March 9th, 1924, the Owensboro, Kentucky Messenger. Spring is here. This morning we saw a robin with his red breast and yellow bill hopping on the lawn. The robin and his mate chose the crotch of a tree or sometimes a cranny on top of the porch pillar to build their nest of grasses, roots, and twigs, lining it with mud. When the three or four turquoise blue eggs that the mother bird lays in the nest hatch out, one may see that the noisy, greedy baby robins belong to the thrush family, for they have speckled breasts like thrushes. But when they grow to the size and age of their lusty father, the breasts will be reddish brown. Earthworms are the staff of life to baby robins, just as bread is to boys and girls. It's been estimated that about 14 feet of worms are drawn out of the ground daily by a pair of robins with a nest full of babies to feed. By fall, the robin's diet will have changed with the season to one of juniper berries, dogwood, and chokeberries. August 5th, 1870, the Columbia, Tennessee Herald and Mail. The Builders by Joseph Alden. A couple of young robins got married and wanted to go to housekeeping. Married robins never bored. They always keep house. Of course, the first thing needed is a house. It is a singular fact that robins never buy houses nor hire them. They always build them. They always build them themselves without any help. Why they're so particular, I don't know. But the fact is that they will not live in a house that anybody else has lived in or that has been built by any claws or beaks but their own. They always build their houses after the same pattern and of the same materials. One would think that among the great numbers who build every spring, some would desire to build their houses a little different from others, but they're built just alike. Another singular thing about robins is that they must have a new house every spring. A great many persons move every spring, but I never heard of a family that built a new house every spring and moved into it. But you'd rather hear about the robins than about houses. Two young robins, as I said, got married and wanted to go to housekeeping. The first thing they had to do was to select a place for building. I think, said Mr. Robin, that we'd better go away off into the woods where the trees are thick and large. We shall be out of the way of boys and cats. Boys and cats are very bad things for robins. They both can climb up to our houses and they both catch and eat young robins when they're learning to fly. I wish there were no boys and cats. I don't like to live a long way off in the woods, said Mrs. Robin. It'll be so gloomy and lonesome. The sun won't shine brightly there. And when it rains, it takes so long to get dry. Well, where would you like to build, he said pleasantly. I think we'd better build near some farmhouse, said she, and have boys and cats plaguing us all the time. I know a place where there are no boys and where the cat is the most amiable creature in the world. The prospect is very pleasant and there are plenty of worms on the currant bushes and grapevines in the garden. Well, let us go and see the place. March 21st, 1915, the Springfield, Missouri News Leader. The Story of a Pair of Robins by James Johnson, age 10, fifth grade, Pickwick School. I'm going to tell you something about a robin. This bird, I think, is very interesting in all his habits and is one of the most useful birds to man. One day I noticed a robin carrying grapevines back to the pergola. In a few days I went to where I saw him taking the bark and other things. Then I saw the nest and the mother robin sitting on it. I went away because I did not want to make her leave the nest. Early every morning I could hear the father robin singing to the mother robin. 
After I ate my breakfast, I went out to the nest. Both birds had gone off the nest, so I climbed up and looked at the nest. In the nest, I saw four eggs. Most robins lay from four to six eggs. They were greenish blue. I ran away, and I had just gotten away when I saw the father and mother birds had come back. I did not go back for a week, and when I did go, the birds were able to fly. I did not let them see me. I hid behind a stone pillar and watched them learn to fly. The mother bird took a worm and flew to another pillar and held the worm in her bill. The little bird, seeing the worm, tried to fly to the mother and get the worm. October 14, 1948, The Baltimore, Maryland Evening Sun. The Early Birds by Hervey Brackbell. 6.40 a.m. A robin with blue bands on both legs arrives, eats two raisins, then drinks half a dozen sips of water from a dish on the shelf. This robin is an old friend, a male that is nested in the neighborhood and also come frequently to the feeder in each of the last two years. He arrived on March 15th this year and has been about ever since, though his mate has not been seen since July 23rd. This is the robin whose nest the banded jay molested back in April. A gray squirrel several days later also nosed about that nest and climbed through it despite attacks by both robins. After that, the birds deserted it. A second nest was built and one young bird raised. A third nest blew down before it was finished. A fourth produced two or three young. A fifth was attacked by, there was some indication, a house cat and was deserted before the eggs hatched. June 26, 1952, Elmira, New York, Advertiser. These birds hitched rides to school. Four baby robins hatched a week ago in Campbell. Should be the best educated birds in the state. At least, they got an early start on their feathered friends in going to school. Harold Austin of Oak Hill, who drives to Campbell school bus days during the school term, thinks his four baby robins deserve a little notice. The reason for all the fuss is that the birds were hatched a few days ago in the nest built on the muffler of Austin's school bus. And the day they were born, they made the first of several long bus trips to school in Campbell. Austin drove his bus twice daily to Campbell and each time Mother Robin would leave the nest and wait on the apple tree until Austin returned home. I hadn't even stopped the bus yet when I saw her flying under it with a worm in her mouth. I stopped quickly and found out that Mother Robin was giving her four babies their first meal, a juicy worm. June 2nd, 1954, the Jasper, Indiana Herald. There was a reason. The mystery of the untrimmed bush puzzled Robert Doherty when he visited Elwood Cemetery. It was the only one in the entire cemetery which had not been trimmed. He looked closer and found a robin's nest containing four baby robins inside the bush. May 28th. 1949, the Sheboygan, Wisconsin Press. Baby Robin holds up construction at garden plant. Perched high on an unfinished section of wall, this robin's nest and the baby robin inside have been holding up construction on the new plant and warehouse addition at the Garden Toy Company. Some weeks ago, when he noticed the nest being built, Martin Denis, contractor in charge of the construction, gave orders that the nest was not to be disturbed. The mother robin laid two eggs, hatched one, 
and the section of wall in which the nest was built is being left unfinished until the baby robin is ready to fly. March 13, 1952, the Verona Cedar Grove, New Jersey Times. Junior high seventh graders relate their experience in studying birds. A little robin was pretty lucky in the intelligent care he got from Patricia R. and her family. He'd fallen from the nest into a pan in their backyard. My father put the robin in the garden. We gave him water with an eyedropper and fed him small pieces of bacon. Every morning when we came out to feed him, we found him inside one of the flower pots in the garden. We fed him for about five days. Then one morning we saw a big robin sitting on the fence. It was the robin we took care of. February 5th, 1916, the Buffalo, New York Evening News. Naughty Francis by Margaret Siegbon, age 11 years. One day Francis's mother made some plum cake. Francis was very fond of this and asked for some. Her mother gave her a piece and gave her brother and sister some. Greedy Francis ate hers immediately. But Anna went up to the nursery and divided her cake into many small pieces. She then called her sisters and brothers and pretended to have a feast. She said the cake must serve as beef, chicken, cake, and butter. Billy did not come immediately, so Anna went to find him, and Mary went into the other room for a chair. While they were gone, Naughty Francis ate half the cake. When they came back, Anna wondered where all the cake had gone, and whispered to her brother that she thought there had been more. After the feast, Billy took them out and showed them a robin's nest with four baby birds in it. He gave each of the birds a few crumbs of bread and then went into the house. In a short time, they went to look for Frances. At last, Billy found her feeding the little birds a large morsel of bread. Two were choking and two were dead. At last, the mother bird came and great was her distress when she found her babies in such a sad plight. She got the bread out of the mouths of the two that were choking. Frances saw how naughty she had been and ran upstairs. Her mother soon came to her room and found that Frances was quite sick. She had to take some bitter medicine, which she did not like at all, and she had to lie down and take a long nap. After she awoke, she heard Anna say, Mother, I don't think Frances will be as greedy and cruel again. Frances heard what her sister had said, and after that, Frances was never greedy or cruel because she remembered the poor birds. February 9, 1901, the Charlotte, North Carolina, Daily Observer. In concluding his speech, Senator Vest treated the Senate to a couplet of poetry. Optimists, he said, who believe that present conditions will always obtain in the United States, have not read the political history of this country. I commend to them these brief reminiscences and those prophetic words of Tennyson. The wind blows east and the wind blows west, and the blue eggs in the robin's nest will soon have wings and beak and breast and flutter and fly away.